tonight's session is extremely popular. It's because that topic is scleral lenses, and it's because of the individual who's presenting on this topic. We all know how they change people's lives. The irregular cornea patient likely headed for a corneal transplant to our severe dry eye patient who can't wear contact lenses and experiences both vision compromise and ocular discomfort, both saved by scleral lenses. Fortunately, scleral lens use is increasing at a very high rate. And fortunately, we have someone like tonight's presenter enthusiastically lecturing both in the U.S. and abroad on this very topic. He's a graduate of the University of Houston College of Optometry and for the past 26 years, owner of the optometric practice entitled Today's Vision Sugarland in Sugarland, Texas. He's a member of the board of directors of the Laser Eye Institute of Houston, adjunct faculty at the University of Houston College of Optometry. He's a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society and co-organizer of the inaugural International Congress of, kind of Scleral Contacts in Miami Beach, which was the first meeting in the world dedicated solely to scleral contact lenses. In my mind, he's one of the most in-demand lecturers in the area of scleral contact lenses in the world, and perhaps our finest anterior segment photographer. You can visualize much of his expertise in our scleral lens troubleshooting FAQs module on gpli.info. Speaking on the topic of scleral lens troubleshooting, please welcome Dr. Tom Arnold. There, there are many more people uh, in the world who have been doing this for lo much longer than myself, uh, but I seized on it a few years ago and, and just really never turned back. So I'm very flattered that you asked me, and, and thank you to the GPLI. Uh, I think you picked me because you know that uh, I probably made every mistake in the book, and so I'm probably a good person to talk about troubleshooting, so I think I've encountered most of these problems uh, and I'm glad to share this with you tonight so uh, yeah you don't go looking for trouble because uh, trouble will find you uh, a few years ago on the, on the Scarlet Lens uh, Fitters um, page the Scarlet Lens practitioners we were discussing about uh, scleral lenses and someone popped up and said fitting scleral lenses is easy uh, and my good friend John Potter responded said yeah it's easy yeah, until it's hard <laughs> you know So it's easy until it's hard, and I think the other thing is that you have to remember, I learn something every day when, when externs come and rotate through my practice or people come to visit. I tell them one of the most interesting things about scleral lenses, and this is true of all um, contact lenses, is that the, the unexpected, and just when you think you have it down and you think you know what's going on, someone always surprises you. So you know, you may think you know what's going on, but it's important to be a good observer you know, look at all the factors and, and not be blinded by, by your previous experience. Be open to new ideas and, and new things. So so these are my disclosures. These people give me the best t-shirts and sometimes I get some colorful socks. I like those. I have to disclose my favorite band is the Beatles. Okay, so enough complaining. But I really am glad to be here. So uh, let's talk about some common things that we all encounter. Bubbles uh, is very, very frequently encountered, especially in new wares. And they come from two different sources. Uh, lots of times it's the insertion technique that, that our patients use as they're getting familiar with lenses. Or bubbles can occur doing wear. And we handle them a little bit differently. So with insertion bubbles, the common causes are you know, not enough saline in the bowl. They don't fill the, the lens adequately. Maybe they don't align it properly. They're not really tangent to their cornea as they're inserting the lens. Or they just jam it on the eye. They're, 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 a, little, um, they're a little timid. And, you know, they're a little uncertain. And so they want to get that lens on, and they push it on, and they'll create a little air bubble. So the remedies are make sure you tell the patients to overfill the bowl. We want a positive meniscus of solution on top of the lens. Insert it gently. It's, I, I tell them it's a docking procedure. It's like docking at the space station. All they have to do is apply the lens. We don't we say insert, but uh, apply is really a better word. We apply the lens to the eye. 
sometimes it's it's advantageous to actually use a stand. Uh, this patient came in, he made his a little homemade stand with uh, with a little cup, and he cut a hole in it, and that way it frees both hands to. Uh, um, pry the lids away uh, and expose the eye. So a little homemade sand. You can also make one out of a styrofoam cup. You just cut a little slit in the bottom and insert your DMV. So this is nice for people with, you know, handling issues. Maybe, maybe um, some shakes, some Parkinsonism, or maybe we've had patients that lose a finger or two. So, so that's good. And and this is what we mean by over overfilling. Uh, overfilling the lens with a positive meniscus. Uh, this is one of our patients who's uh, kind of a good old boy down in Texas. He said, Dr. Arnold, look, look what I found. These are great inserters. Uh, and some of you recognize that these are wire nuts for tying together you know, two, uh, two wires. So uh, whatever works, I said, that's fine. Just clean them. You know, they can't be dirty. So, so these are various ways of, of just a homemade simple stand. Also, adding two, three to five drops of some viscous tears first, and then topping up with your sterile saline. Some people feel that that um, that's helpful in kind of stabilizing this, so it doesn't doesn't slosh around. So those are insertion bubbles, but we also can have bubbles uh, during wear. And that's what we see here in this little picture, these little bubbles coming in, those like in an aquarium or something. And that occurs oftentimes when we're not aligned to the sclera, when our haptics are not aligned. Or maybe we have too much central clearance, and, and as we blink, the lids you know, push down the, on the lens and make a pumping action, kind of forcing those, that air underneath. So you'll hear this a lot tonight. We recommend usually toric haptics, make sure we're aligned to the sclera. Um, scleral tericity can be as much as 300 microns in, in a normal eye. There was a wonderful paper uh, written by uh, um, Greg Denier and Sheila Morrison, I believe Jason Jedlicka. There was a bunch of very, very well-known practitioners uh, this year that, that talked about scleral mapping, and they found that only 26% of, uh, of the patients had a, even a symmetrical sclera, and they were saying that any, any tericity less than 300 microns was actually considered normal. So, so it's quite often that we'll, we'll use toric haptics to align to these uh, irregular scleras. And then, of course, decrease the vault if you feel like there's a pumping action. The other thing we get, and we get this a lot, and uh, here's one of my mistakes. So this is probably why Ed picked me. But uh, we can see here, uh, you know, a, quite a quite a marked decentration, a, a prism type post lens tear layer, and that's because the lens just drops, and you don't need fluorescein to see this. It's very very obvious if, if you use a bright light and a thin optic beam. So you look at that and you go, well, oh, yeah, that's deep decentration, and that causes a lot of problems. And I know everybody remembers their ocular anatomy and remembers the uh, spiral of Tillot. And that's uh, brought about by the different distances um, from the limbus of the uh, recti muscles. And of course, it's a spiral because it's closest uh, in the nasal region, then, then inferiorly, and then laterally, and then superiorly. And we get farther and farther away, and that makes our spiral. And so that contributes to the irregularity of the sclera to which we're trying to align. So that's the spiral of, of Tillot. And that means that the limbus is not circular either. It's a paraboloid. And, and uh, these slides come to us courtesy of Dr. Christine Scent. And this, this is a study that she did on using impression molding technique. And so these are that's an actual impression mold on the left. And we find that uh, the limbus is wider nasally and temporally a longer cord length, in other words, and a shorter cord length vertically. And additionally, that vertical, shorter vertical cord length is higher up on, on the eye. So, and so, you know, Dr. Um, Sin says, well, they're like, the limbus is um, a hyperbolic paraboloid. It's like a Pringles potato chip. And that's why we see in these pictures, that's why you see this excessive clearance. And, and I know anybody that fits scar lenses, this will be a familiar picture to you. And the reason you get that excessive clearance is that that 
that point on the limbus is up higher here, vertically, it's up higher, and so that lens is dropping a lot lower. It's clearing, it's landing down here, so you see a lot of floor seam. And then over here, nasal temporally, then it's coming down a, a rather, rather quick. And so, you know, so it's important to recognize that, and that's often the reason the, the, it, your lens doesn't center well. Another reason, and this comes to us from several years ago by Randy Kojima and, and Pat Caroline, and, and I appreciate them letting us uh, use this slide. They, they measured uh, the angle of the sclera, and we find, and you see that right in this little picture, if you look here at this little thing here. You know, you would think that the eye being a, a globe, the curvature would follow the cornea. There would be the cornea would extend into the sclera and, and still, you know, be curved, but that apparently is not the case. That angle is very, very straight. So once you get off the limbus, very, very straight. Uh, and maybe because of the circle of Tolot or other factors, you see that the angle is much flatter here nasally than it is temporally. It's steeper down here. So this is why your lenses tend to go this way. They tend to go down and out. Uh, and that's something that, that we struggle with. So, so how do we do it? Well, what are our remedies? Toric haptic. Um, and you, those of you might get a chuckle. This this answer will come up a lot during the presentation tonight. So, if you're taking a board exam or writing an exam for your fellowship, and you know you have a multiple choice, and toric haptics one of the answers, well, you know, might likely uh, be the right answer. So it comes from a Greek word meaning to grasp or touch or bind. And so it decenters like that. We've got to do something to keep it up. We have to usually steepen the haptic in the vertical meridian, so so it comes down a little quicker uh, and lands um, lands more quickly. So keep in mind, though, uh, and and I found this uh, in my own just ad hoc personal experience, and it's been verified or corroborated by some of my friends. Um, who've been fitting quite a while. And that is, there's a lot of against the rules sclera uh, out there. That so, so the flatter meridian in your sclera may be the vertical one. It may indicate against the rule scleral tericity. And so, um, you know, you, that may, you may be steepening the flattest meridian in order to, to center it. And sometimes, um, if you use a wider haptic, and, and the, the width of the haptics vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, a wider haptic sometimes helps, gives you more purchase down there on the sclera, and sometimes a straighter one. Some of the, some of the newer lenses are actually described as angles uh, instead of curves, and so that may help um, with your decentration issues. All right, impingement, we, we see this. This comes up from time to time. So you've done your best to align to the, to the sclera, but your edge of your lens digs in. We can also call it towing, is, is standing on your tippy toes. And it's not always obvious, um, and it may not be uncomfortable. Uh, I know we've all had the experience with our soft lenses that sometimes you see a soft lens that's quite tight, um, not exhibiting a, a lot of movement. Um, but then, but the patient's perfectly fine. They go, it feels fine to me. They don't feel it. It's not moving. So impingement doesn't necessarily cause discomfort um, in the patient. But what you want to look for is you want to look for what I call pillowing uh, of the conjunctiva over the edge. That is kind of a buildup uh, of conjunctiva. Now the patient may complain. They may complain of seeing a ring after the removal. They take the lens out and they look at their the white part of their eye, and they'll see an impression ring, and uh, that would that would be very obvious when we stain the eye uh, with sodium fluorescein. You to see a, a ring, so that might be something that that you want to address. So if you see right here, that is the nasal aspect of this eye, this left eye, and so you see that kind of build up. You see, uh, you know, some redness in here. You see this kind of refractile stuff. Looks fine here, doesn't it? Because remember, on the temporal side, it's it's steeper, so they, things are falling away here. But we're digging in to this area, and uh, I'll, I'll show my dirty laundry here, and, and that's kind of what's happening. You can see this is the nasal aspect. You can see that here in the OCT, and it's just kind of digging in. Now, sometimes you get, and this gentleman, I remember him. He's he was one of my earlier fits. He's got keratoconus, and 
older people, probably heavier people, tend to have really these real boggy conjunctivas. So sometimes it's it's not always pretty. You, you do what you can to flatten it um, and 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 align, but sometimes you just it's just going to sink in a little bit. So you just have to monitor it, see if it creates redness or discomfort. Uh, you certainly don't want to create a problem down the road, but now, this is an extreme example, but uh, it illustrates our point. So what do you do? You, you can flatten the haptic. It's obviously digging in, so you want to bring it up a little bit. There's our toric haptic again. You know, we, we use it a lot. Some practitioners use it almost exclusively. Any, any lens that's more than, let's say, 50 and a half, 16 millimeters and larger. On some of the smaller uh, lenses, uh, that's one of the benefits of them for, for advocates that like the smaller lenses, they said, well, you're less likely to need torque haptics because the eye is not as, uh, the sclera is not as uh, torque, you know, closer to the limbus. And, and many lenses now offer quadrant-specific haptics where, where you can adjust all four meridians. Uh, and that's useful in certain cases when you have these very asymmetrical uh, uh, scleras that we talked about uh, earlier. So maybe this is a good time for some preguntas. We're down in Texas, and that means questions. Uh, Ed, uh, do you want to pause here and take any questions? Or I'd, I'd be glad to, Tom. Very good. We, we'll wait and see if there's any that come up. And I know we're early, but um, remarkably, 201 um, attendees today, and we appreciate that. We have – I'll make a couple comments initially. One is I, I, mentioned, I mentioned earlier that we had – the scleral lens troubleshooting uh, FAQs module, and I, I encourage people. Tom uh, contributed probably 35 to 40 photos in that, and it's it's a very comprehensive guide to sclerals. I also wanted to recognize our advisory board members who are on tonight. In addition to Dr. Tom Arnold, we have Bob Groey, Craig Norman, John Gellis, Michael Lipson, Rob Inslee, and Ray Brill. Um, and I think we are getting some questions, Tom. Um, we have a question on how how do you know how much tericity to add to the haptic initially? Oh, that's a great question. Um, th that depends on the lens you're using. Some some manufacturers, their increments are very small, uh, you know, like 30 steps or, or 30, one step is 30 microns or maybe 50 microns. Other manufacturers, their, their, their increments may be 100 microns. In general, I think I'll address this a little later. In general, if you feel the need to change the, the landing somewhat, uh, you need to do it at least, at least 75, 100 microns, 125, changing things 30 or 50, it, you're really not going to have an impact. So if you feel like you need to change, uh, I, you know, I'd say on the order of 100 microns, it would be the minimum. But that's a good, that's a good question to ask the consultants of the lab that you use on a regular basis because uh, I really believe in consultants. They, they help me immensely. Um, and so they know the characteristics of the lens best. Uh, but, but in general, yeah, if you're going to change it, it, at least 80 to 100 microns and oftentimes more. Yeah, that's an excellent point about the consultants. Nobody knows the design better than they do. What next question is? What do you think of impression rings that you, where you you see impression rings, but you don't see any redness or discomfort? Yeah, another great question. Uh, no redness, no discomfort. There's a mild impression ring. Uh, my gauge is uh, I'll ask, and patients usually see it. Uh, they'll usually bring it up to you. If it goes away, like within 20, 30 minutes, I'm not worried about it because, as I said, a lot of people do have real boggy conjunctivas. So, you know, if it's not red, if it's not engorged, and, you know, not uncomfortable, as long as it goes away, um, you know, I, I'll let it go. Um, you, you know, it's the lenses can be too flat, you know, and you can, uh, it, you know, you can you can start messing with the lens, and like I said, know when to say when, and as long as the patient's comfortable and seeing well, and you're not seeing any long-term problems, I'd let it ride. Uh, you know, again, my good friend Chris Sent likes to say, you know, that the, the enemy of good is perfect, and so you can you can chase your tail looking for the perfect fix. You see something that you know, doesn't look textbook, and you start trying to address it, and yeah, you can go through a lot of lenses and, and, and really not, not benefit the patient. 
Yeah, very good. Uh, next question is, what adjustments do you make to correct healing versus towing? Oh, we're going to talk about that. Okay. Coming all right, up. Let's, all right. Um, and, and that may be true of a few of these others too, Tom, and we'll, we'll do that later. If, okay. um, if impingement is noted in, in cases with loose conjunctiva, even after flattening the hoptics, uh, if it's persistent, what would be the next approach? You might, I mean, you, they're not, you know, it could go larger maybe, you know, it could mm -hmm. go larger, um, kind of spread the weight out a little bit. Uh, but again, if it's not if it's not causing a problem, if you if you flatten the haptics too much, then you're going to get bubbles, and then the patient's going to feel it, and you're going to get more midday fogging, which we'll talk about. So, you know, some sometimes you'll see it sink in a little bit. So again, uh, if you've done everything, if you consulted the lab, you've made some changes that you think uh, are appropriate, and you still see it sinking in a little bit, just 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 monitor it. You know, yeah. I would just monitor it. And 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 uh, and going back to the pictures we just saw um, a minute ago, we see the slit lamp picture, and you notice it. And then you look at the the OCT, and that was a real obvious, that was a real extreme example. But some the OCT can be misleading because it only uses one index of refraction, and you you have the lens, you have the cornea, you have the the sclera. And so you can get artifacts. So OCTs can make things look worse than they really are. So learn, learn to believe your eyes. You know, learn to be uh, what we call a good observer. And, and you know, use your eyes. Use your slit lamp technique. The OCTs are great for confirmation. Um, and like in the slide we saw earlier, that certainly confirms that that's digging in. That, that's extreme. I'd fix that. But um, again, look at the slit lamp and, you know, just make sure you know that you're not you're not going for some, not going for cosmetics, okay? Not going for cosmetics. All right. Well, the next question. You're a Texan, so this is for you. Okay. Uh, how do you control allergic conjunctivitis flare-ups with scleral lens wear? I'm in Austin, Texas, and allergies are crazy here. Yeah. Well, Austin's crazy anyway, so uh, I would say <laughs> moo. Uh, but no, I'm just teasing. I love Austin. It's a be beautiful, beautiful city. Um, yeah, I'll talk about this a little later. Uh, some people need need some sort of uh, mast cell stabilizer, or you know, um, something. Uh, I like Pazio. I'm a I'm a big fan of Pazio. It's a once a day dosage. I think it's effective. Um, also, use you can use the um, you know epinastine. You know, uh, that, that works pretty well. It's inexpensive. So some people, uh, you know, Austin has the cedar and, and the oak and all that. Down here in Houston, we have the swamp and, and the mold and stuff. So some people are on some sort of allergy drop uh, year-round. And so that's sort of, yeah, and that's a good, that's a great question. I, I, I thank my colleague in Austin for bringing that up. Don't forget about GPC. I mean, you know, those of us who have been around and whose uh, hair has turned a little bit gray, remember <laughs> before we had disposables and when, when we did have these gel lenses like permalens, right, and, and things, and people would sleep in them for 30 days, we had huge, horrible GPC. Uh, don't, scarls can be associated with GPC as well. It's not as, it's not as common, but it's certainly there. So flip, you know, flip those lids, look at it. Uh, so, yeah, so some people are, are on some sort of, anti-allergy drop, um, oral and uh, eye drops. Yeah, I like Pazio because it's, it's just once daily and seems to be pretty effective. Okay, very good. Just two quick ones before we go on. And I, yeah, you brought up the gray thing. I, I think you're the silver fox. Um, I'm, 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 I'm probably the gray goose and you're the, you know, you're the silver fox. But uh, uh, Hal Ostrom wants to know who your favorite beetle is. Oh golly, that's hard. That's hard. I guess I admire John the most. I, th I think John. I've actually been to Liverpool and, and taken the Beatles tour and, and seen all the sites and stuff and gone through the museum. And when you when you really get down to their story, I, I think John was the guy that drove that drove that bus. Uh, yeah. So I like them all. I'm Very good. Admire them. All but, right. Well, uh, yeah, you know, we see where they came from. They really were poor. Uh, they were, you know, mm -hmm. they really had nothing. Paul was relatively affluent because his uh, mom was a nurse and his dad was like an accountant or something. But um, and his mom died young. So, uh, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So, John, I'll go with All John. All right. All right. Last question: If the patient's comfortable yet we see mild nasal impingement on OCT, do we make a change? No. No. Again, look at it with the slit lamp. 
you know, you're going to see more impingement nasally. You know, now if the impingement's because you have a pinguecula there, which going back to Texas, uh, we have a lot of pinguecula down here because of the sunlight and, and outdoor lifestyle. If it's a pinguecula that's caused that you're impinging into, then you know there, there's uh, you can make notches, you can make microvolts, you can make you know, recesses in the lens. So look at that. Uh, but you're going to flatten. You know, if you're using toric haptics, you're generally going to flatten the nasal uh, aspect, you know, more than the others. Yeah. So, so again, if if it's just the OCT and you don't see it on the soot lamp and it's not red, it's not angry, and the patient's not complaining, I, I wouldn't do anything. Okay. Very, very good. Keep going, Tom. Great. Okay. Super. Good questions. Thank you very much. So compression. We were talking about healing, so this is what we're talking about. So compression happens when we stand too close. Don't stand close. Get away from that limbus. So yeah, so you know, when we land too close or we land too flat, and then we call that healing. Um, and that this this sometimes is is one of the more difficult things to deal with to me. Um, sometimes your lens diameter is just too small. You're you know you're not clearing you're not clearing the limbus properly, or maybe the haptic really is too flat. So that that's the healing part. You remember that we talked about how the sclera is straight when it comes off the limbus. It, it angles straight. And so if your angle of your haptic is too flat, then you're landing on the heel or the, you know, the, the medial um, aspect of the, of the haptic and that you're landing on healing. And so it's not angling properly. Uh, that's one. That's one cause of it. And so you can see how this picture in a different patient, you can see how that looks different than impingement. Because you know, if we look at the edge, well, this look, this is fine. You know, he's all lined right here. He looks really good over here. But but look at look at this, and that's compression. So in, in, in compression bothers me a bit more than impingement because I'm I'm always worried about the. Um, I'm always worried about the limbus and, and protecting it because of the stem cells and, and so forth. So this is, this is compression. And so sometimes what you have to do is just increase the overall diameter. You just have to make the lens bigger and push that landing zone out farther. In some lenses, if you like the overall diameter, in some lenses you can just say make that mid-peripheral zone uh, wider. So again, talk to the consultant. This depends on uh, the type of lens that you're um, using. So you know, you just want to go farther out, or and you maybe steepen the haptic. You know, increase the 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 landing angle so that that you're you're not healing. You're you're actually bringing bringing the edge down. So you steepen, and that 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 depends on the design. Now there is there there are some cases where that the, when the lens decenters, okay, when it decenters, like we saw in the, uh, a few slides ago, then it, it comes down too far, and so it, it's it's jamming into the lower aspect uh, of the eye of the globe, and it's cutting off the blood supply. It's cutting off the flow of those vessels, so they back up upstream. So sometimes um, it's counterintuitive. Uh, you you need you need you need to actually go steeper there, not not flatter. You you need to actually go steeper, and that pushes that pushes the lens back up or, or lifts the lens a little bit. So so generally you 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 will steepen the zone. And what, well, the reason I say it's counterintuitive, usually when you see redness, you 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 think of tightness, you think of something pressing on it, uh, but actually that's congestion or compression. Um, you know by the vessels not not emptying and backing up uh, what we call upstream. So yeah, I don't like it. Uh, uh, compression bothers me. It's it's kind of ugly. And let me see why my slide's not working here. So hang on a minute. Let's just go do this. Get control back. So this is um, so this is this looks good. I like this. You know, so you don't see any compression. You don't see impingement. You don't see compression. So this is this is my goal. This is this is the kind of uh, this is what I want to see. And looking at this, uh, I wouldn't. I'm not worried about what the OCT says because I'm looking at it with my own eyes. 
uh, and, and it works very, very well. Uh, lots of times there'll be some marking on the lens, uh, depending on the manufacturer, you know, showing you where the flat aspect of the haptic is, the, the, the flat zone, and you know 90 degrees away from that, that's your steeper aspect. Or in a quadrant specific lens, they'll be, they'll be marked, the quadrants will be marked in some way. It's important to know where they are because you can specify, I want it, you know, so many degrees temporally and so many degrees nasally and superiorly and inferiorly, but then the lens will rotate. So it's important to know how, how it rotates and where those zones end up, and, and that's important for troubleshooting down the line. So you need to pay attention to the markings uh, and see where they are, and you can see kind of a faint marking uh, right here. And this is what we want to look at. So. The days like this make me make me happy. So uh, you know this 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 is this is a good looking lens. Let me go back a minute. Yeah, we saw the police. Okay, we did that. Okay. So there it is. So anyway, so this is this is what I like. If we can go for this, I'm happy. Now notice that this lens is not perfectly centered. Uh, that lens is dropped a little bit, but uh, everything else looks fine. So you know, talking about remedies for doing this, doing that, uh, I'm not. I'm certainly not going to mess with this lens. Um, and all these pictures that you see are generally after the. These are on follow-up visits. So this is after the eyes. Uh, the lens has been in the eye for a number of hours. So uh, this, this is what we want to look at this, or look for, and, and that makes us uh, a pretty happy. Okay, midday fogging. Yeah, so this this is something that that really drives a lot of us crazy, and and those of you who have fit lenses for a while know know what an issue this is. Um, midday fogging just drives us crazy because um, you know often it's not as extreme as this picture, uh, but it's encountered it's encountered frequently. It's very common. I think uh, Muriel Shornack's scope study. Uh, indicated that up to 50% of patients remove and refill the lenses at least once daily. Uh, I think with, with, with some, some modifications, we can get that down. Uh, it's not that high in, in our office, but sometimes uh, you, do get, you do get really frustrating uh, cases uh, the, of midday fogging. In fact, um, our good friend Maria Walker is getting a PhD in this at the University of Houston, so it's, it really is a serious issue, and it's, it's one of those issues that uh, um, you, you really do need to address because patients do see it and, and it does affect their, their satisfaction with scleral lenses. So one of the first things you have to do is rule out that it's not, the fogging's not due to microcystic edema. And the way to do that is take the, take the lens off uh, and make sure they don't see halos or rainbows. And you can ask them to do that, of course, on their own because that indicates that that's the cornea. When you take the lens out uh, and, and flush the tears, that they still see rainbows. And you really have to look for, for edema. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion about oxygen and edema and, and, that, and so forth in the literature these days. So make sure it's not corneal edema. You also need to differentiate you know, where is is it fogging or is it anterior surface deposits? And here you can see, you know, a lot of lipid deposits and a lot of just gunk uh, on the on the surface of the eye. So that's not like the OCT picture we saw a minute ago. This is on the anterior surface. So obviously that comes from the meibomian glands, and that's the lids versus uh, post lens tear layer. All right, and that's where you see it. Here you can um, you can see that refractile uh, nature of all the you know the proteins and mucus and strands and all sorts of stuff in there. Uh, I think Maria said there's you know hundreds of different constituents uh, to the tear film and and so various things can cause this. So what what can cause it? Well. Guess what? Haptic. You know, we have to align the haptic, especially if it's not aligned properly and you have too much vault. Then the lens can rock, and and this is something that that's come up in the literature and, and discussions with with scleral lens practitioners, is that if if you're not aligned properly, and especially if you have a little too much vault, then you just rock that lens back and forth, and it just it just stimulates you. You're just irritating the goblet cells, you know, in the bulbar conjunctiva. 
And so talking about the scope study and people, about half the people uh, wears have to remove the lens uh, and refill it, you, you, you don't want to encourage that. Okay, you don't want to encourage that because if they're doing it several times a day, it's felt, and, and I agree with this this idea, is that you every time you do it, you, you just re-stimulate the cells. The more it comes in and out, more and more and out, you, you keep re-stimulating. And, and I have found uh, a number of patients when you when you optimize the fit and you just tell them, okay, it's going to happen, and you know, take it out if you just absolutely have to, but try not to, and it dissipates. So I think some of this is adaptation, uh, and I've had several cases like that where just after a while, you know, you see them two or three, four weeks or a month, they say, well, it's not as bad, and it doesn't bother them. So, so anyway, so going back to the too much central vault, too much clearance, and, and not aligning, then you get that pumping action, and that forces to breathe, breathe under the lens. And like I said, rule out GPC because obviously you're going to produce a lot of mucus with giant papillary conjunctivitis. Okay, but on the other hand, on the other hand, the lens also may be too tight, and so we all know that epithelial cells, you know, migrate to the surface and and then slough off, and they turn over rapidly. So this be can become entrapped beneath the lens. So if the lens is too tight, then those tier that posterior tear lens stagnate stagnates and becomes turbid. Uh, and this comes uh, directly from the GPLI troubleshooting uh, guide, uh, Ed, that you alluded to earlier. Uh, and this is on the section by Dr. Shornack and uh, Dr. Melissa Barnett. So I've seen it both ways. The lens is too tight uh, or the lens is too loose. So that's what you see here in this illustration. Um, the lens, this is is a patient coming in with this? You can tell because we have we have fluorescein on the anterior surface as well as you know getting some uptake underneath, but it's not enough, and you can see all this debris uh, in that tear film there. So we don't want that. So in this case, we would loosen the fit. Uh, we would help flush the the tears, and you can see here, same eye later, uh, we don't see all that all that debris. You don't see that in this area at all. So, you know, too tight, too loose, either one of those things will stimulate midday fogging. And it's it's a hassle. We, we really don't like it. So other considerations. Make sure you have good central clearance but not excessive. Sometimes oblate designs are good. Now, an oblate design, of course, is just simply a flatter base curve. And so when you have a flatter base curve, then you can fit it closer to the central cornea but yet maintain, you know, adequate clearance. Um, through through the mid periphery down to the limbus, and um, when we uh, we we do a lot of post RK in Houston, a lot of post RK fits because we had a very we have a big ophthalmology community, and they were very active in refractive surgery in the 70s and 80s, and even into the 90s. So uh, yeah, I honestly I got 30 40 percent of my scar lens fits are post RK, and so they're very very ectatic, very oblate, and so we use a lot of a lot of oblate designs. So here we go, patoric haptics, you know, like I said earlier, about 150 microns difference maybe in these cases. You may want to reduce the overall diameter so you don't get as much rocking. Again, kind of something we've done, talked about before, put three or four drops of a viscous artificial tear in there. That's felt to create kind of a barrier. It's a little bit, it's more dense. The post lens tear layer is a little more dense uh, with something like uh, Oasis Plus or Optive, Refresh Optive, or even Cellulisk. Uh, that decreases the turnover, decreases the, the Im impact of tears coming up under the lens. And try to get as uniform clearance as you can in the mid periphery. Not always easy to achieve, but uh, if you work with your with your consultants and, and work with your designs, oftentimes you can try to get a more even alignment so you don't have any huge um, differences in clearance, you know, from the central to the mid periphery down. So try to align as best you can and keep that post lens tier layer even if you can. And don't forget that these are these are often dry eyes. Uh, we fit scleral lenses you know, to address dry eyes, ocular surface disease. Uh, and oftentimes, as we all know, these are not well eyes. These people have multiple problems. They may have Schroeger syndrome, uh, Stevens Johnson, Graf versus Host. Uh, they live in Texas and they got allergies. You know, all sorts of stuff. Uh, so they they can have dry eyes. So 
treat the meibomian gland dysfunction. It, we all know that if you start looking for that, you'll see it on many, many patients. Uh, and we treat this with lid scrubs, uh, heat mask at home. We may do an in-office lid debridement. Some of these patients benefit from Lipaflow or IPL. Uh, maybe you need an eye wash in the morning, you know, something, something like that. And that's kind of extreme, so maybe you don't need that big an eye wash. But um, you, you can get a, a boric acid saline eye wash, and they have a little cup. And, and we have some people do that in the morning. You know, people wake up and they say, well, I got a lot of mucus in my eye, a lot of sleep in my eye. Have them flush the eye. It, it feels good and gets rid of all of that overnight mucus. So, so maybe, maybe you don't need a liter, but... Um, a little eye flush may, may help you. And we, we mentioned this earlier, too, from our colleague in Austin, uh, mast cell stabilizers. I mean, some sort of mast cell stabilizer, anti antihistamine um, will, will help in that sense, especially during allergy season. But sometimes, you know, it's just, you know, it's just chickens, you know. You just, you just do the best you can and go home at the end of the day and just, that's what it is. So... Uh, don't let the chickens get you down. So conjunctival prolapse, okay. Uh, we see this not uncommonly. I, I had a case today uh, where, where we had this. And that's where the conjunctiva then drapes over the cornea, usually inferior temporally for, for the reasons we, we've already outlined, the, the oval or paraboloid nature of the limbus. Um, and we talked about conjunctiva as being loose. So it's just, you know, the, the conjunctiva just kind of gets sucked up underneath the contact lens over that limbal area. And, and conjunctivas, I think, get more loose, you know, especially in, in our older population. So you see, you're more likely to see this in lenses of larger diameters you have a large amount of limbal clearance, and, and of course, if the lens is decentered, you're going to see that. And this is a this is another case where, well, it's it's not pretty. You know, we we have a nicely aligned lens, we have a comfortable lens here, but you can see that conjunctival prolapse, and that's usually where you see it. You see it typically inferior temporally, sometimes all the way inferiorly. Sometimes you'll see it from four to eight o'clock. Where I've never seen it around 360 degrees. I've, I've been told by people that, that that can happen. But mostly, this is a very common appearance. So, so is it a problem? Well, you know, the long-term effects are, are unknown. Uh, oftentimes, the prolapse resolves when the lens is removed. And this was the case today. I saw an established wear. Uh, for her exam, she was doing fine. She had no complaints. And she had some fairly significant conj prolapse in fairly, but it wasn't red. Uh, she wasn't complaining about it. And when we m remove the lens, it just, it just drops away. It's like it's not even there. So I, I've had some of uh, my fellow practitioners report 20% uh, of patients may have uh, uh, some sort, some manifestation of conj prolapse. So I think it's, in my opinion, it's only a problem if it remains adherent, stuck to the cornea, and the concern there is that uh, you're going to damage the stem cells, may lead to neovascularization, and it might have to be surgically resolved. But, but in my experience, I, I haven't had that. So smaller diameter maybe, reduce the limbal clearance uh, somewhat so you don't have this kind of suction of vacuum effect. Uh, Maria Walker uh, again talks about about a hundred less than a hundred, no more than a hundred microns of limbal clearance to to prevent that. I, I like to see fifty to do a hundred myself. All right, so but Prose, do we have any questions uh, here, Ed? So uh, of, of course, can, uh, 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 what, what we got going now? Uh oh, uh oh. Well, it looks like you're addressing them live uh, from from Moscow. Um, uh, <laughs> no, this was last year. This was last year. A lot of a lot of fun. Oh my! Well, we the first comment I'll make because I know we've had some interest, and I've been trying to answer some questions online, which means some of the questions I'll ask you, you may have already answered, and I missed it. But this okay. presentation will be available online in a matter of days. So it's for people who really want to go back and and customize their interests to the different areas that, that, that Tom is addressing and, and addressing very well. Um, questions that we've had, and again, you may have already addressed some of these, Tom, but we had one, that, what would be the ideal amount of clearance after the lenses have settled? 
uh, that very though again a very controversial topic um, uh, um, depending on who you talk to in, in I'll answer that two ways in general a larger diameter lens you're going to have more clearance just because of the size of the lens and vaulting over the cornea so it, it kind of depends uh, on the overall diameter but I, but I would say kind of a common number that I think most people would agree with would be you know at least 120 at least 100 microns 125 150 upwards to 200 250 maybe at max 300 in a larger diameter lens now there's studies uh, there, there's a there's a, a, a segment there there's a group of, of doctors that really are focused on oxygen delivery and and the decay of the lens which which is affected by the decay over T the thinness the the tear film and they would encourage a, a lower a thinner lens and um, less less clearance to enhance oxygen other people with larger lenses uh, are a little less concerned that they will they will they will tolerate more vault. So I, I would say for most of the lenses that I fit on my patients, and those would be, you know, fourteen nines to seventeens up to about nineteens. Um, yeah, I would say that range. You know, I, I certainly don't want to see it less than hundred microns, uh, maybe one hundred and fifty at the lower end, and you know, north of 200, 250, 275. And and again, when you're fitting keratoconus, remember, especially a lot of our patients who have keratoconus are young; they're adolescents, and, and they may be progressing. And so you, you build in a fudge factor because they can change very quickly. Uh, a young adolescent cone uh, who doesn't have cross-linking uh, may, you know, you, they may increase greatly in, in even a six-month period of time. So they build in a little fudge factor. Some, some lenses settle a lot. You have to watch them. So, uh, you know, you don't want to be on the cornea. Don't want to be on the cornea. Yeah, no, well said. I definitely can vary from design to design. A couple questions pertaining to edema. Once you see microedema, how do you generally move forward with this patient in terms of modifying the lens? Do they have to go off the of lenses for a while? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, I really haven't seen it that much in my practice, Ed. I, I really haven't seen much corneal edema, honestly. Uh, you know, I, 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 I try to use high DK lenses. Um, I, I try not to fit with real ex excessive clearance. If you do see it, uh, I would take them out of the lens, you know, for, for at least, you know, a day, two days. Um, I maybe look at them again. I, I want to look at the lens and say, well, is, can I identify a reason for it? Uh, make sure it's not, you know, some sort of edema because they're using the wrong solutions. It's not toxic, you know, some sort of toxic edema. You'd be surprised what people do. They'll, they'll come in using all sorts of different solutions or use the solutions backwards. But if it's true edema uh, from not enough oxygen, then, then yeah, I think you have to address that in the fit. Uh, and you do that with clearance, lens thickness. Um, designs, things like that. But but I I think I think with a lot of the lenses these days they're very very good. Um, and if you follow the guidelines, you know, in your in your um, in the previous webinars or in the GPLI uh, FAQ guide that you have, and and A. Vanderwarp's uh, very very good book, a guide to scleral lens fitting. And then also there's scleral success. Uh, WW Girl Success, which is a great publication just put out by Dottie Fidel and Melissa Barnett. If you follow those guidelines, uh, I don't think you'll see a lot of edema. You, of course, you're always worried about it in people that had penetrating keratoplasty uh, with the endothelial cell thing. But even in those cases, I, I fit a lot of people with PKPs, and, and I watch them carefully. And so far, so good. Never say never, but um, don't get a lot of edema. Yeah, very good. Now, I apologize if you already addressed this, but one question was, can midday fogging be caused by a uh, type of cleaning or storage solution used? Um, I, if it's the wrong solution, I guess. Uh, you know, certainly you don't want to use, you don't want, you know, that that's not true midday fogging, I wouldn't say. In that case, that's just debris from the wrong solution. So, uh, yeah, you, you certainly, you, we, we, we're very vigilant on our patients. We make them bring their kit to us, uh, follow-ups. We quiz them. Tell us about your regimen. What do you do? How are you using it? So as you don't, and we just, we just are very, um, you know, militant about it. Like, you can't go to the, gro the drugstore and get, you know, 
any soft lens saline that the, the pharmacy recommends and stuff. So uh, if that's the case, you just have to remove the offending agent. Because people do that. They'll, they'll go buy you know, some combo solution because they can't find their, their Adipax or their Lacropure and they'll use it. So that's not true midday fogging. That's just bad solution. And kind of, we had a patient doing it backwards once, you know, kind of an older lady with a neurotrophic cornea and she was storing her lenses in the saline and filling it with her multi-purpose RGP solution <laughs> we were using. So you, you, you got to quit. You assume nothing. Yeah, that's well said. Uh, another question on midday fogging, um, are you just loosening the, when you loosen the lens in midday fogging, are you just loosening the periphery or doing anything centrally? Yeah, usually, usually it's peripherally, yes. Yeah, if you're, if it's midday fogging caused by too, too tight a lens, then yes, you're, you're losing, you're loosening the haptic, okay? But All a lot right. of times midday fogging is, is too loose a lens and you're getting debris pumped under and then you have to tighten it. So it just depends. Okay, very good. Can you uh, throw shed some light on the possibility of quadrant specific changes in the mid peripheral area? Quadrant specific in the mid periphery. Do, uh, some people use that in in their in their their limbal curves. They will have different sagittal depths. They'll create different sagittal depths in the limbal area, not the haptic again depends on the design so that that's how you address that to, to my knowledge that's in the labs I use that's what they do okay we'll just do uh, just finish with a couple others um, okay. I've heard I've heard a suggestion to steepen the base curve to essentially lock out the conjunctiva to prevent prolapse do you uh, agree with this no, I, I don't think I agree with that. Uh, you don't need to steepen the base. You know, base curve, base curve affects power. It does affect the vault, you know. But in general, most of these designs, um, the mid peripheral areas and the limbal areas are different than the sagittal depth. So you don't necessarily have to change the base curve in that in that case. Some of the some of the smaller designs. You do change the sagittal depth and the clearance with the base curve, so it depends on the lens. Um, but I think most of them now, most designs, the those areas are independent and can be adjusted independently. Okay. And uh, last one before we uh, move on. Do you have a rule of thumb when evaluating an elevation map to determine whether you'll fit a scleral versus a corneal lens? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. If you're looking at a corneal elevation map, uh, again, rule of thumb. I, th I think I learned this from Randy Kajima. Mm -hmm. If you if you yep. have like 300, yeah, I learned a lot from Randy. He's, mm -hmm. he's a brilliant topography mm -hmm. guru. If you if you have like less than 300 microns a difference in elevation in your cornea, then you can probably get away with a, a gas perm lens. And, and uh, if it's more than that, then you're really going to have a lot of rocking and, you know, have a lot of, you have to do a, you know, very, very advanced bitorque lens. So they're probably going to be more comfortable in, in a scleral lens. And I do want to say that I, and I'm, I'm thank you for the question. Um, I, I'm an advocate, I love scleral lenses. I fit them all the time and, and they're really a lot of fun. But I'm also an advocate of, of all, all things rigid. So I like corneal lenses. And if, if a corneal lens is better for the patient, I'm going to recommend a corneal lens. I always, always want to do what's best for the patient. And sometimes, in some cases, corneal lenses are just better. So, yeah. All right. Well, very good, Tom. You can finish up. All right. Let's go. Let's go for it. So, higher order aberrations, and and this is something uh, intense area of research, and uh, something that that we do encounter in, in scleral lenses is you know you, the interface of the air and the tears and the anterior corneal surface. That's the area of greatest refractive change. We all know that, and and you got these etatic eyes and these optical errors. They're induced um, by the, these optical errors are induced by this aberrated cornea, whether it's keratoconus or post or uh, PKPs, whatever you got. So in keratoconus, obviously, you have this protruding cornea, you have a regular astigmatism, and so you're going to get higher order aberrations. What's most common in keratoconus is, is vertical coma. In post RK corneas, then you have these incisions, and sometimes they go so deep, they create an irregular refracting surface 
on the posterior cornea, and I have an example of this, and, and conventional squirrels don't address that. So conventional squirrels and some of these really tatted corneas are only going to get about 60 to 65 percent of the total aberrations, and, and I want to thank Gareth Hastings, uh, PhD candidate at U of H, for, for helping me with some of this data, and, and I reference a, 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 a Ref, reference an article there from Eye and Contact Lens. So th this is an important thing. Uh, in new practitioners, if you're fitting scleral lenses, don't don't promise that in a highly aberrated cornea that they're actually going to see better than than their glasses or uh, corneal lenses. They may, you know, that's great, and, and they do, but don't don't overpromise because sometimes they don't see as well. Um, HOAs are affected by age. Coma increases with age. Obviously, irregular astigmatism. Scarring is scarring is very difficult to deal with because it's not it's not really a higher order aberration. It just scatters the light, and so you get glare from that. Pupil size is very very important. It has a large effect, you know, on higher order aberrations and scotopic, photopic age, you know, whether you're young or older. So all these things uh, are dynamic and, and have effects. So high order aberrations um, are sometimes difficult to uh, pin down and then, you know, you have accommodation issues. So I know most of you are familiar with Zernike polynomials and a Zernike polynomial is, is a wavefront description of, of of these aberrations, and we're used to the lower order aberrations. Prism, we can do something about spherical sphere, spherical cylinder correction. So we can get about 85% on a lot of these. But the third order, the trefoil, the vertical coma, uh, the horizontal, all that stuff is, is kind of crazy. So the, the thing to remember is that Zernike, Zernike polynomials are these maps uh, they describe a wavefront, so we go, okay, that's great, and I think I think this illustration is from uh, Ken LeBeau, um, and and if you look at them three dimension, they get really crazy. The issue is how how do I correct that in a lens? You can measure it, but how do I get it into a lens? So good example of not over promising is this post RK that I fit a couple of years ago, and you can see she has central scarring, she has a lot of cuts. Uh, I did. I did the best I could fitting this lens, and it fit well, and she was comfortable. She was, you know, had dry eyes and felt felt real well. So this is the lens. You can see the scarring kind of there in the center and some some RK scars. So I don't know how I can fit a lens better than that. But still, her vision was only about 20, 30 minus, and, and it, you know, she wasn't all that happy with it. She she felt like she could see just as well out of her glasses, and this is why. So you can see I got a I've got a nice fit lens. It's centered, uh, 157 microns of clearance, really ideal. But look at those cuts. Look at the RK, and look at what it's done to her uh, endothelium. And so as the as the lights refracted and and exits that, you get a, just a lot of of distortion. So. So the best you can do at this point is center the center the lens as well you can over the line of sight to reduce the vertical coma. Some lenses you can you can change the eccentricity uh, of the lens, uh, change the, the the rate of flattening, and that may help, and that can do go a long way to reduce aberrations. And of course, several laboratories are working on uh, incorporating higher order aberration correction into the optics, but, but it's kind of a moving target for all the, for all the reasons we talked about. Uh, photopic, scotopic, pupil size, centration, all that. Uh, but it is, it is an area of, of research that uh, people uh, are into, and I think more will be coming. So uh, the main thing, keep calm, clear the cornea, and, you know, just keep the faith, and... Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions now. All right. And I sure appreciate well, you listening. I just want to say, you know, you're welcome to contact me and love to hear from you. And, uh, you know, keep in touch. All right. Love the music, Tom. Very good. Uh, yeah, we'll have some final questions. Um, first one to ask is for an – and we've had a couple pertaining to um, – yeah, let me see if I can get the other one. Um, a couple pertaining to post PK patients, yeah. and uh, one is how do you address the lens to fit adjustments post PK when the surgeon removes sutures and it affects the fit. 
Well, if it affects the fit, um, yeah, you, you have yeah you have to address it. Um, most of the ones I've done, uh, they they've either they either just left the the sutures in or the sutures are already out. So I really haven't enc encountered that uh, personally. I, I would I would say how much is it affected? Um, it, the same rules apply. You don't want to bear on anywhere. You, you really have to clear that junction. Obviously, uh, you, you want to make sure you stay away from the the graft host junction. Uh, you may have to refit the lens, and and you know sometimes patients, you know, may be disappointed or concerned. But you know, it's you're doing the best you can for the patient. If that's what they require, uh, you know, so be it. So uh, you know, again, keep keep in close touch with your your corneal corneal surgeon. You know, make sure you have good communication. But I think you have to do what you have to do. All right, very good. Knowing that you fit a lot of scleral lenses and you use multiple designs, how do you choose the lens design for a specific patient? Oh, that's great. That's great, and, and that's a really good question. First of all, uh, I, I do fit a lot of different lenses cause just because I establish a relationship with different labs, and, and um, I like to test their lenses. But for the, for the, for the average person that's doing this in their practice, I would say get two, two designs Two different diameters, you know, two different fitting philosophies. Maybe add a third, and just work with those. And and so mainly the difference is based on things like uh, what kind of cornea is it? You know, do do I really need an oblate profile or prolate profile? What is the HVID? HVID is a big driver on this, and that tells you what diameter uh, you need to use. So so I would say HVID is is a main thing. Um, how how ectatic is the sclera? You know, by whatever means, whether, whether you're just observing it in your trial fit, or whether you have a, a, a scleral profilometer where you're actually measuring the sclera. So that may that may determine. Well, do I need a toric haptic or do I need a quad specific lens? So you just have to look at the fit. But but if 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 you explore your options, talk to the different labs, visit visit with people at the the major conferences, pick two. Maybe pick three, but you don't need half a dozen lenses. Uh, they're all scleral lenses. They all basically do the same thing, but but some lenses uh, work better on um, different types of corneas. And as as you use your lens lenses, you'll find that well, I have more success with keratoconus with this lens brand, but for post RK or PKP or maybe for dry eyes, I have better luck with this. So you'll you'll kind of pick your favorites. So. You know, is it does it come in an oblate? That's one thing. Do I need do I need an oblate? And uh, what's the HVID? What's the range? Because all these lenses have have a range. They don't they don't go. You know, they don't, it's not a huge range. So you'll need two different ones. Yeah, and I the comment I'll make as well is that, and there are people here who really want to know you know which design you like, which uh, solution you like, and I'd encourage all of you to email Dr. Arnold personally because. That, sure. That's really probably out of the scope of reference for the for the for this particular webinar. But uh, yeah. when another PK patient uh, question, do you have a minimum endothelial cell count before you'll fit a post transplant patient? I had a patient with a cell count of 500, and I didn't feel comfortable fitting that patient. Yeah, that that's a great question. That comes up all the time. Uh, I personally don't have an endothelial camera, and so I really don't look at that. Most of the PK, PK patients come to me, the graft patients, they're referred to me for a fitting. They're referred to me for a scar lens fitting. So I rely on the, um, the surgeon to, to tell me that it's okay, and I rely on them to, to monitor that. I mean, I monitor it cause as far as I look at it. Um, but uh, you know, the, the, the rule of thumb uh, that you read in the literature is about 800 you know, cells per you know, square millimeter. Um, so no, I don't have a minimum, uh, but I really haven't had that much problem with it. And I look, we look for edema, and so forth. Um, so if, if I would run it by the surgeon, if the patient self refers and they've had this old graph and they don't have a a, a corneal, uh, you know surgeon, they don't have a, an ophthalmologist monitoring that, uh, it, it would be prudent to go, go 
establish that relationship, have them look at it, and authorize the fitting. Uh, you know, I think it's good to be cautious. Um, but I think, uh, again, I was, uh, Ed, you and I were talking before, I was with Ken Pullum in England, and, and you know, he's been doing this for 43 years and, and fitting all these things. And, and he fits a lot of them. And he said, I, you know, I have very few problems with, with rejection and stuff. So I, I, think it's, I think it's important to realize, but no, it, it's not a contraindication to me personally. But I have real good relationships with, uh, with the corneal surgeons. And uh, yeah, it's something you take seriously. Good, good. We'll just finish with a handful of quick questions. Um, okay. One um, the question pertaining to notching, you know, how notching works like for pinguiculas and yeah. uh, how you go about it and how you decide the size and how the solution doesn't, you know, pour out uh, because of <laughs> I don't. The, uh, the, the current designs that I use don't really, aren't a true notch. A notch is just a cutout. Uh, and, and that's been done uh, you know, a lot and for years. The, the newer designs um, actually have more like a tent design. You know, they, they kind of vault it so they align more, more evenly than, than a true notch. Some, some are just a recession uh, into the lens. And, and that, how you specify it depends on the lens manufacturer. But mostly it's you establish an axis what's the axis and you can do that by making a small split you know small slit beam excuse me rotating rotating the you know your light source so that beam is aligned at whatever angle that that you want the notch at you, you record that angle and then you try to measure in some fashion uh, you know how wide is this pinguacula or pterygium uh, how deep is it? And, and so you convey that information. So it's the axis of it, uh, it's the height of it, it's the width of it, and different lenses that you will use and encounter have their different uh, methodology for determining that. Yeah, and and oftentimes you you will want to use a toric haptic on those to stabilize that lens and make sure the notch always is in the same place or or, or micro vault or whatever you have. Yeah. Okay, very good. You have to be careful about the, the notches, and the reason I make a, a differentiation there, you, you make a, a, a notch where you just cut into the lens, then in the middle part of that notch, the lens is going to be fairly thick. You're going to have a fairly thick edge there, because you're just going into the you know, kind of the, the body or the meat of the lens. And so these, these kind of vault-type designs, I think, are better, because you would keep the integrity of the edge, the thinness of the edge, but you then just, you know, you just kind of leap over uh, this elevation, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the question about what percentage uh, would you say of your scleral fits are for dry eye patients? And I'll preface that by going to scope study, Nero Shornak and all that participated, many, many, many thousands of patients. They found 16% of scleral lenses were fit for dry eyes, 74 for a regular cornea, and 10% for healthy eyes. Um, how about with you, Tom? Yeah, I'd say uh, I really like – scleral lenses are great for dry eyes. Uh, I would say it's probably about 10%. Uh, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd like to do more. You know, I, I, would, I would certainly like to do more. So I, I think 15% is a, a good thing to, to go for. But in my office, probably about, about 10%. But they're great for dry eyes, and, and they're great for multifocals as well. Some of the new multifocal designs uh, that are that are on the market now and, and, and soon to come are really great because, uh, you know, the presbyopes are getting older. Their eyes typically are dry if they've had post -ar if they were post RK. Their eyes, uh, you know, are, are certainly dry, and so a scleral lens is great in that has an advantage over many of the corneal designs in that you can center it and you can have a lot of control over the optical zone uh, and so so they're really great for that so yeah they're they're super for dry eyes I, I would we, we've increased our dry eye clinic um, um, you know profile uh, quite a bit in the last couple of years so I hope to do more uh, that's great and it also helps me had I know we had some questions about multifocals as well um, our friend Mike Lipson wants to know, have you seen a change in acuity when you change from prolate to oblate designs? 
Oh, that's a great qu question. It's a great question, and Mike is a very good friend and, and has a tremendous amount of experience with that. Um, yeah, we can use your oblate designs uh, to minimize uh, high minus lenses, of course, because you can make a you know reverse tear film. So it's really great uh, in in changing the power of the lens. So you don't need as strong a lens uh, in in a high minus situation. Uh, some people feel that um, in a in a um, multifocal design it's superior as well because you bring the optics closer to the eye so yeah uh, there's uh, uh, our good friend Lanjis Mashad uh, gives a great presentation on uh, using oblate you know reverse curve lenses you know in 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 prolate eyes you know there's a lot of advantages to it uh, a good friend Ed Boschnik down in Florida who I respect greatly and just fits a tremendous amount of these pretty much uses reverse curves on everybody so, um, yeah, thank you, Michael, for the question. But I think you, you can use an oblate lens to improve the optics. Yeah, I, I believe that that's the case in, in, for some patients. All right, very good. And we'll just do two more. Um, when billing for a fit, are you charging for anterior segment photos? If so, what's the diagnosis code? And I should. I don't. I, I don't, mm -hmm. and and the reason I don't is is I I'm probably just lazy. But you know, we fight with insurance over so many things. And the reimbursement, I think, is fairly low. Uh, don't ask me for exactly how much it is, but it's not that much. And so it's just one more thing to fight over. So I, I, our overall fees are fairly robust. Uh, I learned this from John Gillis. Uh, so John, I, I hope you're still on the call. Um, that that w I think we charge enough. We're proud of our our, our fees, and so uh, yeah, we we do, we charge for OCT. We charge for topography. Uh, I don't charge for anterior segment uh, photos because because of the, what you just said. What's the diagnosis code and how do you support it? It's not that much money anyway, so no, I don't I don't bother with it. Okay, final question is uh, let me go back to and find it. What is your uh, what's the maximum wear time you recommend for patients with a scleral lens? You know uh, that that these are all great questions and and uh, we come up. I tell people. I said I, I expect 10 to 12 hours of comfortable wear. Uh, that's my goal for you, patient. Many patients wear them 12 to 14. I tell patients as long as they're comfortable, they, they can wear the lens. I don't want them sleeping in it, obviously. But we tell people, okay, I want you to, for a real ectatic eye, you know, these patients who can't see, when they take their lens out, their day is done. They can't do anything. They, they have to go to bed. So those are the ones you really have to encourage to take out. And I will tell them, I said, you can wear them up to an hour before bedtime. And I tell them, I, I want you to take it an hour before bedtime because you may have some swelling in the cornea. You do have some edema. That's that's well accepted. I said, uh, you got to get rid of that edema. You know, you, you need some oxygen. And so I, I sell them on an hour uh, before going to bed. They need to take it out. But the real reason, Ed, the real reason for doing that is so they remember to take them out. <laughs> because I, I know all of us who fit these lenses uh, have experienced it. Patients just forget. I mean, they, they don't want to take them out because they can't see, and they get tired, and they just go to bed. Uh, had one guy pulled over for uh, 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 outstanding traffic takes and spent the night in jail, and he, he couldn't take uh -huh. his lens out. And he, he came in and said, Dr. Arnold, I'm just so sorry, but you know, I had spent the night in jail. <laughs> well, poor guy. And he was fine. But that's the real reason is I tell them. Uh, so they can wear them as long as they want. Um, but I, they have to come out before sleep. So. Yeah, very good. All right. Well, we'll bring tonight's program to an end. And I, I want to thank Dr. Tom Arnold for really an, an outstanding and, and very important presentation. And, and I have to tell you, state-of-the-art photos, um, very, very entertaining and informative and, and just uh, recognized by just the number of you who are kind enough to take time out of your busy schedule to attend tonight's presentation. Please come back. Join us Tuesday night, November 20th, when our pre-Thanksgiving webinar will be Overnight Orthokeratology Lens Design Fitting and Problem Solving. Our lecturer will be one of the best, Dr. Bruce Williams. We we'll look forward to seeing you here next month. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much for having me.